So this we have uh, joining us today, uh, Steve Simpson. He is the Director of Legal Studies at the Ayn Rand Institute. And he is here to answer any questions you may have about uh, professional development, uh, career choices, and uh, living a productive life. So Steve, would you be able to tell us a bit about um, what you do in your career and kind of the history that led up to that point? Sure. Um, so I'm the director of legal studies at ARI, the Ayn Rand Institute, which probably all of you know. Um, and uh, essentially what I do now is I write and speak on uh, legal issues from an objectivist perspective. So you might think of me as a policy guy, think tank kind of guy. Uh, I can delve into more about that, but um, I'm a lawyer by training, so I, uh, uh, I went to law school uh, about 23 years ago. Um, yeah, I've done, uh, I worked for a federal judge, I worked for a law firm, and then I worked for an organization called the Institute for Justice, uh, which I don't know if people know about it, but it's a libertarian uh, public interest law firm, essentially like the ACLU. It sues the government on, the, on behalf of individuals to vindicate certain constitutional rights. I did that for about 13 years. Um, and then I ended up uh, here uh, at ARI because I wanted to move into a more policy writing direction. I was, uh, um, I was just getting a little bit burned out by the practice of law, uh, although it still really interests me. But I mean, that's really briefly my career path. I can say more about the details of it, why I did what I did and why I went to law school. Uh, but why don't I pause there and see if, uh, you know, folks want, want me to elaborate or have particular questions. Sure. Um, I think since we have a small group here today, if one of you wants to ask a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. But let me just go ahead and ask a quick follow-up question. Did you always want to go into law? Is, uh, is that something you always wanted to do? Not at all. Uh, so I went to, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I went to college. Um, I basically, you know, I, I just, I went to a small liberal arts school in New Jersey called Drew University. And, and I didn't have any particular path. I landed in uh, biology, uh, you know, as a biology major, mainly because by process of elimination, it was the least objectionable thing that I could think of doing. But I didn't really have any kind of focus or path. Um, frankly, my, uh, my then girlfriend and now wife was a biology major, so that seemed like a good enough reason to be a biology major. I don't think, I, I don't recommend it, but there are worse ways to, to land in a particular major. Um, but I really didn't have any direction. And out, after college was when I really started thinking seriously about what I wanted to do. Uh, and, and essentially, you know, I, I had an interest in philosophy. This was when I discovered objectivism and I started thinking more seriously about philosophy, about ideas. Um, I was at the time working for a real estate developer and I came into contact with lawyers and essentially, I mean, again, I can elaborate on this, but I'll try to keep it brief. I found what lawyers did really interesting. Um, and I thought law was a really interesting topic. Um, it seemed to me that lawyers had a had knowledge of the world and the way the world worked in, in a way that I didn't. So I paid more attention to what they did. And the more I learned about what they did, the more I thought I would like it. So I ended up pursuing law after basically four years out of college working in the, you know, in the real world and just uh, looking at what people did and, and kind of examining what I thought was interesting um, on really a daily basis, what I like to do. I like to write, I like to speak, I like to argue. And I thought law was, a, was an interesting topic. Um, but that's essentially how I ended up in law. But yeah, I had no idea until after college what I wanted to do. Okay, thanks. Uh, does anybody else want to ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Hi, Steve. Thanks uh, for joining us. And uh, thanks, Tyler, for organizing this. So I was curious in how you discussed your decision to go into law school. Can huh? you provide some concrete examples of what aspects of law, maybe what's the classes, or you talked a little bit about what you observed how other people acted. Can you go a bit more into what concrete things encouraged you to apply for law school? Yeah, definitely. No, that's a really good question. Um, so I guess I would put it this way. Uh, I mean, I said I worked for a real estate developer and uh, the, um, the, uh, the company I worked for owned a lot of rental properties. And just in the nature of the way things work, 
tenants often sue their landlords. And my uh, the guy I was working for didn't want to go to landlord tenant court. And it w we were able to appear in landlord tenant court without a lawyer, meaning pro se. So uh, he basically sent me in his place often to go to landlord tenant court to represent uh, us as the landlord. Um, and I found it fascinating. I found what happened in court to be really interesting stuff. Now, mind you, this was, you know, landlord tenant court in, uh, in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, it was a real interesting experience. And basically, I was there to be yelled at by, uh, by tenants who, um, who were mad at the landlord and usually by the judge. And I still found it really fascinating just the way the whole system worked, uh, arguing my side of the case, doing a crappy job of it and wanting to do better. Um, so that was one component of another component of w is the, uh, the company I worked for had to hire law lawyers often. So I got to interact with lawyers. I dealt with them on a daily basis. And I thought it was really interesting how, um, lawyers essentially helped their clients solve difficult legal issues. But I mean, and how, you know, it, it found, I found it really fascinating that they weren't just, um, they weren't just telling people what the law was they were counseling them and really trying to help them navigate and think through complicated difficult issues and that just appealed to me I like the idea of um, the way i would put it is this so i was interested in philosophy at the time and i didn't think i wanted to be a philosopher i liked the application of ideas i looked at law as sort of applied philosophy in much the way engineering is applied physics right so if you don't want to be a theoretical physicist, you like making things, you like applying ideas to reality, maybe you would gravitate to engineering because that's an applied science. Law is very much like that. It's You could think of it as applied philosophy, applied poli you know, political philosophy, applied ethics. And I just like the idea of communicating to clients and helping them solve um, legal problems. And so I, the, the more I looked into it, and the more I really studied what lawyers did, uh, the more I learned that that the skill set, writing, speaking, appealed to me, arguing, and then the, the specific topics, the more I read up on it, I found those interesting as well. So that's, you know, um, that's how I did it. And I mean, there's more I can say about that, but anyway, I want to keep pausing. But one of the points that I'll make as a sort of affirmative point is when you're, when you're kind of fishing around for a career, it's really, really useful. In fact, if I could give you one piece of advice in searching for a career, it would be figure out what the career, what the, what the people who work in that career do on a daily basis. And then ask yourself, would I like to do this thing? Is this how I would like to spend my time? Writing, speaking, dealing with clients, even researching. I liked doing that. If I didn't like doing that and I just thought the well, law was interesting, I would never have been a successful lawyer. So there are often many factors when people choose a career path. One of them is something you, that you enjoy, uh, or is something that you want to spend your time doing. Another is competence, right? You have to be able to be good at what you're doing. Are there other fundamental yeah. factors that you had to consider or that you found that other people had to consider when choosing a career path? Um, I mean, I think those are the two big ones. I think you put it really well. In fact, in the notes that I wrote down before, uh, you know, having this session, um, those were two of the things that I was going to say to both people, things that you really enjoy doing and what you're good at. Um, and that's really worth paying attention to. Um, and, and part of the reason for that is you enjoy doing what you're good at. And I, I, I found a lot of people, they end up going to careers because they think they would like them just because the career seems interesting. But they don't have, they've never really thought through to what extent am I good at actually uh, doing the skills or to what extent do I have the skills and do I enjoy the skills that are actually necessary to this um, career? Uh, and then overall, do I just find the career and the topic interesting? And for law, for me, both of those were definitely true. But if I didn't like to write, if I didn't like to speak, if I didn't like to think about ideas, I wouldn't have liked being a lawyer. No matter how fascinating, you know, lawyer TV shows seem, or even just reading about the law, um, you know, that never would it wouldn't have worked for me. So, uh, paying attention to what you really enjoy doing, and and again, what you're good at, and why 
you gravitated to it and why you you know why you are good at it because you're, you're good at things that you enjoy and there's a there's a real kind of positive feedback loop to those two things but i i think those are the two big ones now i mean financial considerations are an issue uh a lot of people go into various careers because they think they'll make a lot of money at it i don't think there's anything wrong with that but with the big caveat that money alone is not enough of a reason to go into a career but you do want to think about that i mean so as a as a concrete example of why in today's world law school is wildly expensive um if you don't have some kind of a plan for paying for law school, dealing with the debt that you're going to incur if you go to law school, and this is true of any professional school, you know, you're gonna be saddled with lots of debt, you're gonna feel like you're um, like you're always scrambling to kind of pay catch up, play catch up and, and get out from under the debt and support yourself. And that's a real consideration. You wanna take that seriously. Um, so I, you know, while I don't think financial considerations should drive your career choice, you have to be realistic about what what financial considerations mean um, for me and for I think people going to law school it means you've got to be you know you should have some idea of what is your plan for paying for law school you know if you're financially independent or your parents can pay that's great if you can't do that you're gonna to have to take out loans you, you need to have a plan for how am I gonna you know deal with all that debt afterwards um, and, and really take that seriously um, so I don't want to you know a lot of people will say don't worry about money i mean you know yes but with the big caveat that you you have to have some kind of a, a of a plan or strategy for you know supporting yourself or at least dealing with the the out-of-pocket costs of you know educating yourself right all right well does anybody else want to ask a question Tyler, yeah. are you still there yeah i'm still here can you okay. see me? Yeah, now I can. Okay. Alex, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, Mr. Simpson, I'm curious. How did you make the transition from being a practicing lawyer to somebody who deals with the abstract nature of law? Um, I was always interested in the abstract nature of law. In fact, I would put it as that came first and then the interest in the career came second. I'm really glad that I paid attention to the second part because if I if I hadn't um, I, I don't think I would have ever made it as a lawyer and and, uh, and really gotten involved and as interested and, and you know successful as I was ultimately able to be but because I came to it from the standpoint of I'm really interested in ideas and I knew at least after college that ideas were, were of interest to me in philosophy and you know the broad range of ideas I had a real interest in that um, but I mean, more it, more specific answer to your question. So you know, I practiced law for a number of years, and then I made the jump to doing what I'm doing now. Um, I paid attention over the time that I was practicing law to you know I, I would put it like this: in any phase of your career, whether it's the very beginning where you're thinking about what you want to do, or your mid career, and you're thinking about what the next stage is, you always want to be paying attention to what are the kinds of things I like to do. And, and that's true in a broad sense, and it's true in a very specific sense. So when I was litigating and practicing law, I loved doing it. I loved arguing with people. I loved representing clients. I loved suing the government. Really satisfying stuff. Um, I loved the writing. I liked the arguing. I liked developing my skills. But, you know, I got to a certain point where um, that, you know, I had mastered a lot of those things. I had done a lot of that kind of stuff. And I thought it's, at, at a, you know, over a, a, the course of a few years, what would be the next stage of my career? What do I really like doing? And I, I realized that, uh, you know, writing and speaking about ideas from a more, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't quite put it abstract as abstract um, as I would put it from a broader standpoint of arguing about the ideas and how they apply as opposed to, you know, putting them in the kind of practice that, that uh, you know, being a being an active lawyer takes. Um, but I really thought about, you know, would I like to have a career of just sitting behind a computer, say, and writing or speaking to people? Uh, I'd done enough of it that I, that I knew I was interested in it. But again, you know, in that transition, I wouldn't have been successful if I hadn't thought about it beforehand and really realized I, I, I like writing and speaking for its own sake every bit as much as I like doing it in the, in the context of law. 
Does that answer your question? Okay, good. So when you are planning for um, a career that you want to go into, oftentimes people uh, go into college and they have to study before uh, perhaps getting into the practice. So how does how did you um, how did you learn that uh, going into law is what you wanted to do before you started practicing it? So did you do uh, did you take part in internships? Is that how you went about it? Um, no, I, well, you mean out of law school or during law school? How did I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. So, um, I was, uh, let me think about this. So I did a number of things really. And, uh, I mean, the first thing I did was dur during law school, I just paid attention to the kinds of things I like to do, uh, and the kinds of classes that I liked. Why did I like these particular classes? Now, for me, it was a little difficult because I pretty much liked every subject in law school other than tax law. That was about the, the only subject I really didn't enjoy. And even that is kind of fascinating now that I think about it. But um, so what I did during law school, I knew broadly speaking, I liked litigation, which is one branch of law. And I like transactional law, both. You can really divide law into both of those types. So corporate law is transactional law, mergers and acquisitions, real estate transactions, you know, bank finance, all of what goes on on Wall Street. Litigation is arguing in court. I knew I thought they were both interesting. Um, the way I, I decided to uh, figure out whether which one I liked, I started off by taking uh, by going for a job, and I, I got a job clerking for a federal judge. Um, a, a law clerk for a federal judge basically, they're they're the sort of the lawyer for the federal judge. They help the judge decide cases and research and, and, and write the orders and, and other things that the judges do. That exposed me, I knew going in, that would expose me to a broad range of, of things that lawyers do and give me a better sense of whether I like litigation more or transactional law. Um, I went to a law firm with the same idea in mind that, um, that you know, uh, if I experience what, what lawyers do in practice, I'll have a better sense of that um, so I guess the way I would put it more abstractly is you think of it, I thought of my career as it's, it's kind of a funnel approach. You take a, you cast a really wide net and then slowly but surely you narrow it down. And as you get more experience and as you experience more um, aspects of the, uh, of the profession, you get a better sense of what it is that you like to do. So, you know, I cast a broad net. And it didn't hurt that working for a federal judge was, judge was a great way to um, to learn, you know, about the law and hone my skills. And then I went to a law firm, and my idea going into a law firm was, not I want to be a law firm partner. Not that there's anything wrong with that; it's a great uh, uh, career to have. But that I want to learn about this, and and I want to get, you know, I want to develop the skills that I need. I want to get the training that I need. And not for nothing, making a lot of money as a, as a law firm associate is not the worst thing in the world because I can pay off my loans. But you know, as I worked in in different uh, jobs, I honed and kind of uh, narrowed my uh, sense of what I wanted to do, and finally realized, yeah, litigation is definitely for me. Um, and then had the opportunity. You know, I thought more about what um what different uh litigators do i knew that there was the practice of constitutional law i knew that ij existed so i set my sights on on working there okay great and does anybody else want to ask another question yeah go ahead uh maybe i have to unmute you there we go. To me? Yeah, yeah. Can All you right. hear me? Yeah, so. Okay. Um, it's just seems some, you talk about oh, hold a on. kind of. <laughs> so we're on Ricardo, I think, right? Yeah, go ahead, Ricardo. Go ahead. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Simpson, you talk about a kind of transition between the federal courts and then you going to ARI. I want to know. There were certainly new skills you had to learn, new competences. So I want to know how did you deal with that? What, were, what was your attitude towards it? How, how was that change to you? Yeah, that's a good question. Although one clarification, I went from working for a federal judge to a law firm 
for about five years. Um, and then from there to the Institute for Justice. Um, but the, the, the question is a really good one in that, um, yeah, how do you, you know, how do you make the transition? How do you develop the skills? Um, I mean, basically my approach was to, I mean, I knew, so you know a few things going into law. You know that writing is a big part of law. You know that developing your thinking as a lawyer is a big part of law. You know that researching is a big part of law. Speaking is a big part of law. And then just gaining the substantive knowledge about uh, different fields, are those are all important to the practice of law. So that's pretty obvious once you get into law school. Uh, and uh, you know, from there on out, the question is, how are you going to develop those skills? My approach was to throw myself into um, anything I could work on that would get me the the the, um, the training that I needed. And I mean, writing was the big thing. So uh, you know, as a as a law clerk, essentially what you do is you you write and you research. I took it really seriously. I paid really close attention to to um, how the legal process worked. I was always working on honing and developing and bettering my skills. So every time I wrote something, I would you know, reflect on it and think about how can I do a better job with that. Later on, when I went to the law firm, I got used to being uh, critiqued and edited and frankly, having my work product torn apart by really smart people repeatedly. And you, you, you know, you can, you can look at that and bristle and get pissed off that, oh, people are criticizing my work, or you can look at it as an opportunity to improve. I very much took it as an opportunity to improve, um, but I paid really close attention to you know, why are these people, you know, editing the way they're editing? How do they approach the writing process or the thinking process? Why, when I read their writing, why do I think that it's good or bad or otherwise? Um, so any skill that you need to develop, you want to look at how other people that are good at it, how they approach it. You need to understand what is it that you think is good about it. So, you know, as somebody interested in writing, I took a very, now why was I interested in writing? Well, I was really interested in reading. You know, I, I, I read you know, uh, all kinds of things. Ever since I was a little kid, I read everything. I read novels, I read nonfiction, I read magazines, newspapers. And when I became conscious of the fact that I wanted to become a good writer, I started paying attention to why do I think the people that I read are good writers? What is it about their writing that, that makes it good? When I see people editing me or, or I read their briefs or articles that they write, why are they good, why are they bad, and, and oftentimes just talk to them. What is it about my writing that's no good? You know, how can I improve? Uh, but part of it really is um, you need to, I think, there are a lot of ways I can put this. One, the, just the blunt way is you need to embrace hard work. You need to embrace the difficulty that it takes just to learn a skill. But, but one of the things that I learned when I was at a law firm was the way I'll put it is the joy of hard work. Um, I worked really hard. I worked, you know, 12, 15 hour days often. But in the course of doing that, I came to realize there was a real payoff, that I was learning how to discipline myself, that I was learning how to, frankly, how to work hard is itself a kind of skill. Um, and until you do it, you don't know that you're able to work for 15 hours a day you know, I've, I've spent many sleepless nights realizing that, you know, I can still write a coherent sentence after 24 hours without sleep. Not that I recommend that you try to do that, but, but I mean, learning how to work hard is its own skill set and learning the joy of hard work is a real benefit if you want to develop your career. So I would sum it up as saying, pay attention constantly to what, you know, good people are doing and work constantly on honing your skills. Just the way you would have say you wanted to get in shape. You know, you'd go out and you'd you'd work out and you'd you know you'd know that you 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 know you ran a mile in ten minutes, next time you need to run it in nine minutes and keep cutting time off. It's the same thing with developing any kind of career skill. You just have to you know, you have to be willing to work hard at it and pay attention to what makes good people good. Ricardo, does that answer your question? Oh yes. Great. Charles, would you like to ask your question? I'm glad you started talking about that, Steve, because my question uh, articulated a little bit more simply is, um, 
at a certain point, there's a need to be efficient in what you're learning and to try to distill abstract and concepts to what you need for your job. So how can you concretely work hard such that um, you can you know, write down things that, like oftentimes I write down things that distract me that are a little bit not efficient. Uh -huh. So obviously law might have a lot of junk associated with it. So when you're working, do you have like a concrete way of saying, this is productive work. And then if I have something that I have to know, but it's not productive, do you like have a little journal that you write kind of distracting ideas? Um, sort of, but I, I, the way you've described it is a way better, more conscious approach to what I ended up doing. Um, but I mean, I think, so I'll describe what I did and then I'll touch on what you just said. Uh, what I used to do is, uh, I mean, I would say I, I'd have a, a complicated legal issue that I needed to research or understand or communicate or write a memo on. Um, you know, you dive in, you start to read up on all of the different research that you need, all the knowledge, start gaining knowledge. And I mean, at a certain point, you figure out what the process is, but the way I would put it is this, the first thing you have to do is learn what it is that you're trying to tackle and understand, no matter what the the, the ultimate out, outcome is, whether you're building a house, building a bridge, or writing a, a book or a legal brief, you still need to understand the source material and you, and you need to understand the principles. Um, and there's a process of thought, uh, Ayn Rand, if you got, I don't know if you guys have ever read The Art of Nonfiction, but she talked about uh, the idea of stoking the subconscious. So what you're doing is you're, you're learning, you're, you're driving the information in a sense into your mind, understanding it, integrating it with uh, what else you know and gaining a facility with it. That's a process that just has to take place in the same way that, you know, if you analogize to learning a sport or learning a musical instrument, you know, first you just have to get the basics down before you can do anything with it. So doing anything productive is it involves that process. Now, when I would work on a, a task, I would just take notes constantly on legal pads and I'd fill up legal pad after legal pad after legal pad thinking, oh, this is brilliant stuff. I'm doing my first draft. You know, This is all going to be great at some point. And at some point in my career, I realized I do all of this, and then I throw the legal pad in the garbage, and then I go out and I write the, uh, write the actual brief. Um, that wasn't wasted effort. That was all effort that was necessary to learn and to, to uh, work out what I needed to say and, and, uh, uh, and go through the process of thought to hone my thinking. The way you've described it, I think, is a really effective way to do it. It's it's put your ideas and your thoughts down on paper somewhere. Um, you know, you, you, it gives you a way to separate the, the essential, the good information from the, from the information that's not useful. If you can be, have the presence of mind, as you put it, to, uh, to understand what distracts you and what drives you away from really effective work, by all means, take notes on that, be conscious of that. But the, the broader principle is, you do have to have uh, a consciousness or a presence of mind about, you know, what ultimately is efficient thinking versus not efficient thinking. But I would say when you're early on in your career, just be present, just be, sorry, aware of the fact that you need to be thinking of that. Don't put too much stress on yourself. I have to be able to separate the good thinking from the bad thinking. It's really be conscious of how I go about doing my tasks and then gain an understanding of what's effective work versus not effective work. I mean, to, to give you just a, a kind of silly example, although I, I'm like, you know, I procrastinate, I do all kinds of inefficient things. So getting up 20 times to go get another cup of coffee, or if I'm working at home, oh my God, I need to go clean the dishes right now. Inefficient, right? More efficient sticking to sitting behind my computer and actually um, doing something and putting something down on a piece of paper. That's a good example of, you know, procrastinating versus efficient work. But it gets harder when you're trying to separate out what is, you know, efficient, really efficient work versus not efficient work. I wouldn't worry too much about that when you start out. Um, I would just be conscious of as you develop and as you see yourself producing more, try to gain an understanding of when you're falling into distracted, you know, useless work versus really focused work. But it's not easy. I mean, don't beat yourself up too much about it. One of the things that I really liked about law is that I had externally imposed deadlines on um, court, court deadlines. I had to meet these deadlines. 
it's kind of terrifying at first, but you know you can't miss that deadline. It's, I find it actually more difficult in certain ways to do the work I do now because I don't have an externally imposed deadline on myself, so I have to motivate myself, or sometimes I have to ask other people to you know, impose deadlines on me. But, but just understanding that about yourself is useful. Um, you know, and there are all kinds of tricks you can use to sort of prompt yourself to stay on a schedule. I mean, the, you know, um, just having a schedule and deciding, right now, for the next two hours, I'm behind my computer and I'm churning out something as opposed to screwing around, exercising, or wandering around talking to colleagues or whatever. Um, just having those kind of devices uh, are they're, they're very useful methods of, of uh, you know of good uh, of of work or, or or effective work. Is that helpful? Yes, and uh, I appreciate that. Today, I actually uh, applied a lot of what what you said. You know, so thanks that um, I think you concretized that pretty well. Thank you. No problem. So Steve, you spoke earlier about the, the joy of hard work and the importance of kind of cultivating that. How did, exactly did you cultivate that in yourself? Did it just come naturally? Because there are plenty of people who engage in hard work but don't necessarily have this kind of reverence or uh, respect or evaluation for it. It's just kind of something you have to do. And I guess a follow-up question to that is, did philosophy play uh, an important role in that? So I can easily answer the second part of that first, which is philosophy really didn't play a role other than once I figured out that I liked to work and that there was a real joy in hard work, then I could circle back and say, oh yeah, that actually makes some sense based on, I mean, by this time I was an objectivist and thinking about uh, the virtue of productivity and, and you know, you read Atlas Shrugged and you see the characters and how she talks about um, their joy in work. I put it together after the fact, but I didn't. It's not like I read Atlas Shrugged and I said, "Oh, work is a work is you know productivity is a virtue." Therefore, I, I love working hard. It's not at all the way it worked for me. Um, now, part of this has to do with just I was in a sense fortunate enough uh, to having uh, I grew up in a situation in which I had to work from a relatively young age. Not that we were like wildly poor or anything, but it was just part of you know growing up in the time period that I did and in the family that I did, it was expected that you would work. And so I had jobs from the time I was relatively young, say 14, 13, 14 years old. So you you learn something about, um, you know, just uh, work and why it's interesting and why it's, why it's, why there's joy and productivity. But I didn't really put it together until I got to, I think consciously, I didn't put it together until I got to the, to a law firm and I ended up staying, you know, I ended up spending days where I would be leaving at work at midnight. And I can, I mean, I actually remember a specific moment where I was working in Washington, DC, leaving the office at midnight. I'd spent the entire day working really hard. And I noticed, I actually feel great. I'm tired, but I feel great. And why do I feel great? People talk about this as hell. They talk about, you know, spending, uh, uh, working until midnight as the worst thing in the world. And yet I'm tired, but this is pretty cool. So I just reflected on it. Why do I like this? Why do I think this is good? And I realized, well, I actually like the law. I like doing the hard thinking that I do. Um, I feel really a whole lot of pride in the fact that I worked, you know, for the last, I don't know what it would have been, 15 hours, and I still feel like I want to continue to work. Um, that's a cool thing. This is actually productive. I'm making a lot of money. I'm advancing my career. You start putting all these things together. It's not that I would isolate and say, you know, hard work is just a virtue. It's not a virtue. It has to have purpose, right? So it has to be connected to your life. I don't want to just go out and dig random holes for the sake of digging random holes in the ground. That's not uh, enjoyable. But when you connect it to your own values and you realize, hey, there's a real payoff here. It's part of a process of advancing my career over time, then you can start to be conscious of, yeah, that's a cool thing. And I actually like to work hard at this. Now, take another example really quickly. I think exercise and music are two good examples of this because a lot, it's, it's easy when you're young to see, I mean, I played basketball when I was in college and I, I played all the time. And, you know, 
I loved playing for, I, I could play for hours and hours and hours, be utterly strung out, completely tired, and I still wanted to keep playing because I loved it, right? Same thing with a musical instrument. I mean, my younger brother played the guitar. He would practice for 15 hours a day and his fingers would be raw and he'd still want to keep playing. That you can see that as a young person. Hey, this is cool. I really like doing it. I like diving into this. Um, I guess the lesson to take away from that is that applies to a lot of different things that aren't quite as their their their, their immediate sort of gratification isn't quite as obvious when you're young, but you can extrapolate from that and apply it to all kinds of different endeavors. And you realize when you start thinking about it, yeah, I mean, life is a series of of productive enterprises and doing all kinds of things and you know, assuming you're not just like sitting around sleeping and like eating and doing nothing else or just doing things that are, you know, obviously pleasurable. Um, you're doing something that has is a kind of a means to an end. And if you enjoy the, the if you're ultimately working toward the end, you should you should really enjoy enjoy the means. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. That makes sense. Good. Would anybody else would like to raise a question? Josh, you've been, I don't mean to call you out, but uh, you've been a little quiet. Would you like, do you have a question in mind? No? Okay. Josh, Josh has heard all this from me before, so he's like, yeah, this is <laughs> Okay, well, time around this guy. I'll go ahead and ask another question. You were talking about uh, um, kind of comparing yourself to the kind of work that other people did when you were talking about um, learning how to do your job well. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in um how that factors into say self-esteem because mm -hmm. some of the common advice of developing good self-esteem is not comparing yourself to others instead you know comparing yourself by your own standards how have you personally progressed so how do you how do you maybe balance that or understand yeah. that in such a competitive environment like law yeah that's a really good question um because it's a um you know, you can definitely make a mistake in comparing yourself to other people. So my point is not use other people as your standard of success. That's definitely not the point. It is though, seek out people who are who are good at what you're trying to do. Now, it should be they really are good as opposed to you or other people just think they're good. It's not like a popularity contest, right? So you do have to be discriminating here. And, um, but I mean, you, especially when you are like, again, to, you you know those of you who exercise or play musical instruments or, or take any you know, do any kind of endeavor in life you can tell that there are some people out there who are really good at, at doing this thing and and you know and now you want to break down why is it what is it about the way they do it that makes it good and then how can I relate that to what I'm doing um, so you need you do need to seek out and spend some time thinking about what makes a person good at a particular uh, skill now writing. I mean, it's, it's uh, the, the best way I can say, really, I think this applies to anything, but I mean, if it's at least a skill that you're, that is, that is, um, that you're engaged in, in some sense and not totally alien to you, um, you can tell, I think you, you can, you know, figure out what it is that makes for good writing versus bad writing. Although there's a, there's a process of really honing your ability to tell the difference between those two things as you work through it as well. Um, but uh, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a whole thought process you have to go through to sort of figure out what it is that makes any skill um, or what it is that, uh, that exemplifies, um, you know, a good version or, or uh, you know, uh, a good example of, of a particular skill or a particular uh, quality or, or pursuit. Um, some of it involves just learning about the area. So, you know, I couldn't. I couldn't say. You, you couldn't say something like, um, uh, you know, just sort of pay attention to what good lawyering is, and then and then follow that because good lawyering is a package of a number of different kinds of skills, and that there's a whole learning process in, in figuring out what that is. But if you if you break down those skills into their constituent elements, that's where you need to start to try to figure out either what makes it good or who's good at it. Um, I mean, I don't want to try to, you know, go into too much detail on, on how you do that. It's it's a kind of a complex process, but um, 
you know, there, there are various ways just figuring out from your own standpoint, you know, um, uh, what, what, what it is that you think are good about the skills, reading what other people say about those, those skills or those, uh, those pursuits um, that make them good. But I mean, I guess the takeaway is, you know, the, the idea that I'm talking about here is you're not finding your standards in other people. You are finding good examples of, um, of, you know, the pursuit of or the execution of a given skill. And then you're using those people to model good behavior um, or to emulate as, as examples of, of, you know, what are, um, you know, or, or as, as examples of, of that skill in action. But you do have to be careful not to put your, you know, the, the idea is not what do other people think of me. It's what do I think of, um, uh, of you know, how other people pursue this and um, what are good examples that I can actually follow. Okay, that makes sense. And so another question I have is about uh, law in particular. So is there any... Um, is there any particular advice you have for people who are interested in pursuing a career in law? Any advice for getting into that field? Anything that uh, that you've learned in that field that you want to pass down? Yeah, I mean, um, let me think about this. So, other than what I've said, you know, the, the, I'll I'll reiterate that the best thing you can do, I think this applies to any field, but um, is pay attention to what the people in the field do. Actually visit with those people and talk to them. Um, and so in the field of law, law, obviously, to the extent you can seek out lawyers and ask them what is it that you actually do on a daily basis or just pay attention to what they do, um, that's really useful. Uh, in terms of, I mean, more concrete, I, you know, if you're really interested in law, you need to figure out, do you like to write? Do you like to think about ideas and apply ideas? Do you like to uh, analyze arguments? Do you like to debate with people? Uh, how detail oriented are you? Um, that's a big skill in law. Um, do you like analyzing and kind of logical reasoning critical analysis, that kind of thing, meaning criticizing or thinking through uh, arguments and, uh, and written work. Do you like editing? Do you like researching? These are all part of the skills that go into uh, being a lawyer. And just are you interested in the, in the field of law? I mean, you could, there's tons of books and um, writing on contemporary historical issues in law. I mean, this may sound silly, but do you like you know legal TV shows and why do you like that? Now that's it's it's a little bit touchy. Don't you don't want to take too much away from uh, from that kind of thing? But do you like legal issues? Uh, do you follow you know high profile trials? Do you find it interesting to watch what these guys what what lawyers do um, in these settings? These are all cues or ways that you can figure out um, if law is is a is a, a pursuit that you really enjoy. And then beyond that, I would say, um, I mean, the two best things you can do for, for getting into law school are essentially do well in college and then, you know, do well on the LSATs, which are the law, law student or law school um, admission tests. And there are all kinds of ways that you can do to prep for that. But um, uh, yeah, I think those are the, the things that I would say are, are most useful. The one thing, uh, one thing I would say that you don't really need to do um, is pursue pre-law in college. I don't think that's particularly useful. Um, it doesn't mean don't pay any attention to law if you, you know, when you're in college if you think you want to go to law school. But there's, there's no, um, there's no uh, requirement that you pursue pre-law or any specific set of classes in college in order to prepare you for law school. I didn't do that at all. And I think most people who are successful lawyers don't necessarily do that. There's no need to do it. So, um, if you're in college uh, and you're you're thinking of law, you know, do well. It's much more important that you do well in college and get good grades and learn good study and work habits than it is that you take a pre-law course. Not that there's anything wrong with doing pre-law. It's just you, you by no don't, by no means do you need to do that. Okay. Thanks. And Charles, you have a question that you'd like to ask. 
Yes, actually, it's a comment, if that's all right. Sure. Would I be able to run by anything, unless anyone else has a question? Because um, I'm going to wait. OK, so I have been thinking about examples of what you've been saying and how I think that a lot of people could be really receptive to these ideas. Like, I think that I didn't work a whole lot until I was a high schooler. And even doing that was like putting together a puzzle on things that I don't feel like I was getting. And I still went to a pretty good school, but I'm going to run this by you, which is um, I think that it's generally at a as a generalization good to introduce kids to meaningful work as early as you can. And obviously, I don't support like doing things that are antithetical for growing up. But I think that I could have had a job when I was 13, but I didn't. So do you think that's true for most people that there is a certain point which earlier meaningful work is better for puzzling this career thing I, together? I definitely do. Um, I mean, I, I would put it as not just for working out um, or, you know, figuring out your career, but just learning about the world and, and, and uh, a, a very important part of what, you know, goes into finding your way in the world, which is figuring out what work is all about and just being self-sufficient um, and then learning good practice. I mean, there's so much, so many benefits to working um, in some sort of a more formal capacity than just sort of doing the laundry or cleaning the dishes around the house. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a big advocate of that. I will say as a parent, I have three kids. It's really hard to motivate kids to work. And it is especially so the richer our society gets. I mean, there's a, there's a funny kind of paradox in that the more the, the wealthier we get as a society and it's frankly everybody is getting wealthier the less push there and reason there is to make kids work uh i think you said something like you know not doing things that are antithetical to uh to child welfare the older i get the more my my response to that and this is half joking is nah we could be a little less less you know a little more antithetical to child welfare and a little more you know kick people on the butt and get them working. But that's because I have three kids at home who don't work as, as, as much as I wish. I say that jokingly, but uh, I mean, I really, I don't mean that from a, you know, obviously you don't want to do things that are antithetical to child welfare or anybody's welfare, but, but, you know, motivating people to do work and sort of nudging them a bit more. I'm a big fan of that. And, uh, and, and ultimately, I mean, put it this way, um, nudging yourself to do work is much more important than nudging others or worrying about, you know, parenting kids or, or whatnot. So, you know, really think about how to motivate yourself to work. It's not easy. I mean, you know, ton, zillions of pages of books have been written on this topic. It's a hard topic, uh, but, you know, um, put thought into it and, and try to find ways to really motivate yourself to be productive. It doesn't mean it's a sort of commandment. You know, you don't have a duty um, you shouldn't think of it as a duty. It's a it's a it's a mistake to think of it as, as a duty. Um, that said, sometimes just sheer willpower is what it takes to really get yourself, you know, uh, moving forward and 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 doing things. And it 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 helps to have done work as a as a young person. And even if you know, you're you're all older than thirteen at this point, you can you can apply yourself in all kinds of different ways and develop good work habits now. It's not like oh, if you didn't work when you're young, you know, you're lost. I don't mean that at all. There's never, you know, there's always uh, an opportunity to, to, to be productive and motivate yourself to do the things that are, that are necessary for success. Thanks, that answers that. And I suppose there is an element to um, myself that I realize how much fun it is, which is why I'm kind of romanticizing what a, the past, but also I have a young sister, which mm -hmm. made me ask that question. So right. thanks for clarifying that. Josh, you have a question you'd like to ask? Sure. Uh, on the same uh, link of motivation, self-motivation, uh, something that comes up with me often is uh, I'm a sort of person who works really hard right before the deadline, I guess. <laughs> you know, we, we can all empathize with that. Um, but there's, there's a problem that I have and it's maybe a failing is burning out. It's sort of working really hard for a period of time. I know there's so many tests I've worked for, stayed in one room for a week and studied, and then for like a week after I didn't do anything. And I think that's yeah. really harmful 
uh, I'd pref much prefer to have a more consistent lifestyle. Uh, are there any, is there anything, any comments you'd have on that and maybe improving that? Um, I mean, one, the first thing off the top of my head is if I could solve that, I'd be a billionaire. Um, I mean, it's a real, and it's not, it's a really good question and I have a few thoughts on it, but I mean, you're right. This is, so I spent my entire career basically doing exactly what, what you say. It's working my ass off for particular deadlines and then, you know, feeling afterwards totally, you know, devast not devastated, but just like burned out. Um, and it's, it was that kind of cyclical approach, or at least early in my, at certain points in my career. But um, I guess what I would say is, I mean, planning is really useful and, and just planning out what things you have coming up. Um, you know, the, if you're interested in a given discipline or topic, um, uh, one of the things that you should always work toward is learning, you know, on a kind of ongoing basis as opposed to, so if you think about it from the standpoint of, you know, a class that you're taking, you know, you, you obviously don't want to save it all to the end and then cram. It's not an efficient way to learn. Um, but if you can motivate yourself to be interested in the topic such that you can, you know, keep yourself steadily working and, and pursuing it as you go, it's, it's way easier to learn it over a gradual period of time than try to cram it all in your head. And it's frankly not all that useful to try to cram it all in your head. But there are times when you just have to work really hard, you know, on short deadlines. Um, you know, the, I don't know, I, I don't have much to say about how to avoid that. It, it's a, it's part of, um, it's part of, you know, pursuing any uh, productive endeavor or, or any kind of discipline. Um, one, one good piece of advice I'll give you is, you know, learn to take breaks and to, to step away from any hard project, um, and just sort of let it rest and give yourself a rest from it. So as a more concrete example, anytime I'm right at working on any kind of written product, I'll work on it furiously for, you know, days or weeks. And there comes a point when I just need to set it aside and take a kind of breather from it because there is a sort of burnout from it and it's not productive to continue to spin your wheels um, on any project when you've, you know, immersed yourself into it, in it to such an extent that you're just sick of it. Um, so if you can build in time, say if it's a written product, to work on the first draft and then set it aside for a few days, come back to it later, you'll have a fresher perspective on it and you'll be mo more motivated to work on it. Um, ultimately, the only real answer to that process is planning, um, learning to plan ahead. I'm not particularly good at it, so I wish I had you know real good advice for you for doing it. Um, scheduling, having other people help you with uh, with that if you're in a work environment where, where there are other people, you know. Um, I block out on my calendar periods of time for writing now uh, so that I can generate pro work product on an ongoing basis as opposed to just, you know, trying to cram it all um, or, or uh, get it all done in, uh, you know, at the last minute. Um, there are all kinds of books on this topic that are worth reading. Um, so I'll just leave you with, you know, Work hard, but take breaks away from the work that you're doing so that you can gain some perspective on it and take a breather from it. Uh, that'll, that'll actually increase your productivity. Thanks. So Steve, um, I understand that you, you work at the Ayn Rand Institute now, but you discovered the philosophy of objectivism sometime before that. So I'm interested in how that philosophy affected your uh, career path and in what ways you've benefited from that philosophy. Um, that's a really good question. I, I just really quickly, I discovered Ayn Rand's philosophy when I was about 23, so 1988 or so, um, and it wasn't for over 20 years um, you know, before I came to ARI. So I spent a lot of time as a, an objectivist before really having anything to do with ARI or even being too connected to the movement, just for a variety of reasons, mainly I was just too busy. Um, but how it benefited me, I mean, so one one that I already mentioned, it gave me a real appreciation for uh, productivity as a virtue and why it was a virtue. 
Now, as I said before, I figured that out in a sense concretely or in my own life and that I really liked being productive before I connected that to productivity as, a, as an abstract virtue or as a virtue in, you know, in principle. Um, but, but it was good to know that, right? So the fact that I was an objectivist and I was able to realize, hey, this thing that I really like doing, working hard and being productive, it actually fits into a broader philosophy of life and I understand why it's actually uh, useful and beneficial in principle. And now I get it in, you know, in fact as well, in, in application as well. So just knowing that and having that context was enormously uh, helpful. And that's true of all of the virtues, you know, any, any, and, and they apply to everything you do in, in life. Um, so it's, it's just useful to know why is honesty a virtue why is integrity a virtue? And then you get to see it in real life. And you, I mean, I didn't, there's a lot of stuff that you don't know. So yes, in principle, I knew integrity was a virtue. I don't think I was in my 40s until I really understood, okay, now I really get why that's a virtue. And I can see the benefits in my own life. If it weren't for objectivism, I never would have had that moment of, of getting. Now I can connect the concrete to a broader um, philosophy that helps me integrate all kinds of information that I would never have been able to integrate if I didn't have that philosophy. So, you know, that's kind of one um, broad benefit. Knowing, I mean, the, the kind of work I did at IJ, so suing the government, it's a long-term, um, it's a long-term incremental process. It does not pay off or there's, there's, there's you know, there, there, there's no uh, obvious, um, it's it's not obvious that an organization like IJ or any organization fighting for freedom is making progress in the moment. It's a long-term proposition. To keep yourself motivated, you have to have some sort of a system of values that says this is good work, it's worthwhile work. Uh, objectivism provided that for me. It provided me with a moral confidence to do what I was doing and have confidence in my own um, in my own ideas and my own assessments of the world because I had a way of validating, I had a methodology for validating that what I thought was, um, you know, at least I was applying a sensible objective process to coming to conclusions that I were, was coming to. And without that, you know, a lot of people just fish around for understanding why are their ideas, why do they think their ideas are better than anybody else's ideas, why should I have confidence in my views at all? Objectivism gives you that and it's enormously powerful. Um, the final thing I'll say is having an appreciation for an objective methodology for uh, you know, conceptualizing and the process of conceptualization, um, just knowing that there was such a thing as a method of thinking, especially when you're grappling with a difficult area of, uh, of thought or ideas like law, which has to be categorized, it has to be um, uh, organized into some sort of a, of a coherent whole. And there is a real coherence to the law, uh, but they don't really teach you that. It's not like the first day of law school, they say, here's how to organize the entire field of law. They don't do that at all. When I went into law school as an objectivist, I knew that it was important to organize my thinking. And it was enormously beneficial and, it, and it's paid off throughout my entire life. If I didn't have that appreciation for just conceptual clarity and organization of thought and methodology. And I wouldn't have, you know, so much of what I was doing would have just felt like I was at sea and I didn't know why is this organized this way? Why not some other way? Um, being an objectivist, it allowed me to really think hard about that. It doesn't mean that the way it was organized, I always thought it was right. I'm meaning the, the field of law, but I could look at it and I could say, where do I think they, that law is going right? Where do I think it's going wrong and how it's organized? And I could bring to bear a kind of critical um, perspective and a self-conscious perspective on that um, that I never would have had if I wasn't an objective. I mean, there's lots of other benefits, but those are just a few. Yeah, that's all really interesting. So I think we've reached the hour mark by now, and so I just want to let anybody, any of you who would like to ask another question, go ahead. Um, but if not, we can go ahead and bring this to a close. Yeah, yeah. Ricardo? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yes, you can hear me? Okay. Um, in your specific case, were there many ideas, attitudes, 
methods to be found in the law school that you had to simply out uproot given your knowledge of projectivism I mean how are you able to to deal with that kind of I mean in my case uh, I'm going to a liberal arts school so with a rational philosophy so I have to do a, like a side process of my own education along with what I learned from, from college so you have to do something like that process in your school? Um, kind of so the way I would put it is um, what I did was I always asked myself are the legal do I think the legal principles I'm learning are correct and true and why or why not um, so that's and that's the that's the approach I would take so I mean unless you're in a completely bogus field I don't know you know there are, there are totally bogus field fields out there of study um, I, I won't try to list any of them off but unless you're in a, a totally bogus field most uh, you know, pursuits, academic or, or intellectual pursuits are worth understanding, even if they're wrong, right? So, I mean, you could study Kant's philosophy. It's definitely worth understanding Kant's philosophy, even though, um, uh, he, you know, he was wrong. And there are all kinds of uh, things that he did were, which, which were wrong. You can take any field of study like that and recognize that, it's, okay, philosophy is legitimate, even though there are all kinds of philosophers that go wrong. Law is a legitimate field, even though there are all kinds of aspects of law that, that, that go wrong. What I would say is when you're young, it's it's more it's important to critically analyze and ask yourself, where, where do I think they're going wrong and why do I think they're wrong, but still take seriously um, uh, what it is they have to teach and, uh, you know, separating, even having separated out the, the, the correct from the incorrect, um, try to get an understanding of why it is that you're being taught this why it is this is part of the field of study and even if they've made mistakes why is it that they've made mistakes the mistake that a lot of people make and especially objectivists is encountering ideas that they think are wrong and just dismissing them entirely without paying attention to them i could have done that as a lawyer there's a lot a lot wrong with the way law is taught there's a lot wrong with just the law as a subject and the way law is done throughout the world today, not just in America. But dismissing it would have been a really a, a giant mistake. I would never have been able to develop uh, my thinking as a lawyer if I just said, this element of contracts is wrong, or con law, I mean, the whole area of constitutional law is screwed up. But if I just dismissed it all as well, I, I, I don't care about that anymore. I know lawyers or, or objectivists who've gone to law school have done that. I think it's a real mistake. Um, if you're gonna do that, drop out of law school and go pursue something else. But be, be aware and be really sensitive to, okay, even if I think this is wrong, wh why have they gone wrong? Why am I being taught this? And, and be very careful to you know, avoid dismissing whole fields just because they, they're wrong or they make mistakes. They're still important oftentimes in, uh, in understanding a field and why the field is the way it is. And even if you want to criticize it, um, you're not going to be taken seriously and you shouldn't be taken seriously if you don't understand why it is that um, these are parts of the field. So I know that's a kind of an abstract answer. It's hard to give a more concrete answer without really delving into, you know, the concrete mistakes. Um, what I would say is learn the subject matter and be critical about thinking about it, but make sure you learn it first before you decide whether it's right or wrong. Okay. Just a quick follow up. Uh, this may sound silly, but were you able to apply some objectivism while you were working as a lawyer? Oh, definitely, but not, I mean, in, in a certain sense. I mean, I was fortunate enough to work at an organization uh, in the Institute for Justice that um, the, the ultimate pursuit, protecting freedom, was entirely consistent with, you know, the philosophy of objectivism. So there was a, there was a consistency in ultimate purpose, and because of that, uh, you know, I was able to bring to bear my my philosophy and the positive, the 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 um, the, uh, the 
the sort of positive takeaways, the concrete, you know, prescriptions for what the, in the political philosophy and the and the and the moral legal philosophy, in a way that you know many people would not be able to do if they were just practicing law, um, you know, in private practice. Um, but I would say that was the least. You know, the, the, I, I used objectivism in my career much more in the ways that I said before, in, in reflecting on how to think, um, in why the virtues are virtues, in having a, a good methodology, then in a kind of uh, in the in the way that objectivism, you know, according to objectivism, obviously capitalism is good. And I was, in a sense, at IJ supporting capitalism. You know, I didn't sit around and say, well, because I'm an objectivist, you know, I, I can validate my own career. That's not how I approached it at all. It was, I enjoy doing this and I want to pursue these values. Um, but I brought objectivism to bear much more in the pursuit of the values than in what the end product was. I hope that makes sense. I know it's a little abstract, but it's really hard to, to explain this without going into tremendous detail. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to thank all of you who joined us today and brought your amazing questions. And Steve, I want to thank you so much for your insightful and I think very motivating answers today. Thanks. And thanks all you guys are all really good questions. Um, all you guys look from there. I know I've met, I think I've met all you guys, but, uh, but if, if we run into each other at any conferences or anything, please come up and say hi, except Josh, because I've talked to him. No, I'm just kidding, Josh. <laughs> Um, all you guys. Uh, so I, I look forward to interacting with all you guys again. So this has been great. So thanks for having me. Yeah, sure thing. All right. Bye, everyone. Hope to see you next time. Bye.